a KQED HD production. Sleep. Shakespeare called it nature's soft nurse. It draws us, great and small, into its embrace. A ritual close at hand, at once familiar and elusive. Sleep is really one of the last great scientific mysteries. We're really at a, a revolutionary stage in science where we have some wonderful technologies to help us perhaps for the first time understand the functions of sleep. Sleep seems to be present in every animal organism that we've studied to date. Sleep has forced its way through each and every evolutionary step, which tells us something about the fundamental importance of sleep, that it must be necessary at the most basic of biological levels. Like eating and drinking, sleep is essential for survival. Our desire for it is set deep within ourselves by a circadian or daily master clock that hardwires us to feel naturally more awake during the day and sleepy at night. Every day we will need an environmental cue to reset the clock to, to make it 24 hours. And the most potent signal is our daily light-dark cycle. And the light will come in going through our eye and into our brain and reset the clock every day. There is a second factor which drives us uh, to sleep or not sleep, which is how long we've actually been awake. If you haven't slept for maybe 36 hours, it's probably very easy for you to sleep in the middle of the day when otherwise you normally wouldn't be. The demands of our fast-paced, caffeinated lives underscore our species' unique relationship to sleep. After all, we can choose to sleep less and fight our body's circadian tendencies. I can't operate without coffee. I wish I actually could sleep more, but I basically work a lot. And I know when I don't get enough, I'm really crabby the next day. But does our mood really suffer when we don't slumber? The answer to this question has kept some people up at night, like Matt Walker and his students who are studying the sleep-deprived brain at the University of California, Berkeley. Here in this study, we actually were showing subjects a series of words on a computer screen, just like I'm showing you here. In one group of participants, they'd had a good night of sleep before we exposed them to the words during learning. Whilst in another group, they were actually deprived of sleep for one night. Two days later, the groups were again shown the series of words, but now some of them were new. They were told to pick out the old words from the new words. Participants in the sleep deprivation condition were about 40% worse at learning new memories. But they did better at remembering the negative words than the positive words. When you're sleep deprived, you have this overwhelming dominance of negative memories relative to positive, pleasant, or neutral memories. And to further understand the connection between sleep and memory, it helps to first know about the dynamic journey your active but sleeping brain takes through the night. In humans, we have two main types of sleep. We have, on the one hand, non-rapid eye movement sleep, or non-REM sleep for short. And non-REM sleep has been further subdivided into four separate stages, increasing in the depth of sleep. Upon falling asleep, your brain will quickly descend down to those deep stages of non-REM, stages three and four. It will start to rise back up again, and then it will have a short REM sleep period. The brain goes down into non and up into REM every 90 minutes. REM is the stage of sleep when dreaming occurs and the eyes move quickly back and forth. Sleep scientists can track it and the other stages through associated changes in electrical activity in the brain and other parts of the body. During non-REM slow-wave sleep, stages three and four, the brain actually seems to be perhaps replaying the same signature of learning that was experienced during the day. And it may be that perhaps that strengthening of that same memory circuit at night by way of replay during sleep may allow you to then come back the next day and be able to recollect those memories more easily. But the sleeping brain isn't just passively replaying the memories of the day. When it enters REM, 
It dreams, reordering our memories, editing them to surreal effect. Is there method to this madness? REM sleep, the state of course most commonly associated with dreaming, may play a special and unique role in seeking out and identifying connections between related memory items, where REM is taking these individual memories and bouncing them around in that attic in the brain and testing which connections it should build. When you start to fuse two things that shouldn't perhaps normally go together, it sounds very much like the basis of creativity. And perhaps that's one of the unique functions of rapid eye movement sleep. Learning and memory aren't the only things that suffer when we don't sleep enough. When you don't sleep enough, you need to eat more food and you feel more hungry. If you sleep less than five hours or so, you know, your profile of glucose and insulin seems to look almost pre-diabetic. But how much sleep do we really need? Surprisingly, the answer to that question may be in your genes. My name is Ron Bachman. I'm 71 years old. I've never set an alarm clock in my life. There are some people who do completely fine with only six hours. Also need eight hours or nine hours. You just have to figure out how much sleep you need to feel fully awake during the day. My average amount of sleep is about five and a half to six hours. Um, and when I do get up, I feel very good. In fact, if I try to lay in bed, I can't, so I found that it's just as easy to get out of bed and start my day at an earlier time. Ron's sleep pattern is rare, and it's the rare and unusual that interests UC San Francisco geneticist Ing Wei Fu. She's compiling a database of people who have unusual sleep patterns. There are the short sleepers, like Ron Bachman, and the extreme morning larks, who go to bed around 8 and are up at 4 a.m. The database also has DNA from night owls. Every time we find a mutation in a gene, that gene kind of serves as a starting point for us to expand potentially to a large number of different genes that are all related, involved in the same pathway. In, in this case, sleep. In 2009, Professor Fu and her research team zeroed in on a mutation on a gene they found in a mother and daughter who only need to sleep six hours a night. They put the mutation into mice, and sure enough, the mice slept two to three hours less than usual. It was the first gene that implicated in regulating human sleep quantity. Identify a mutation or a gene, it's like finding a very specific piece in a big puzzle. So my goal for this study is to try to identify as many as possible pieces of puzzle in sleep regulation. Then we will be able to come up with more intelligent therapeutic intervention to help people with sleep problems. Come on in here. According to the Centers for Disease Control, roughly one in five Americans annually suffers from sleep disorders. Some disorders may be temporary, but others can be chronic and extreme. The electrodes relay data like brain activity and muscle tone that can help reveal telltale signs of a sleep disorder like narcolepsy, which causes sudden, uncontrollable episodes of sleep. This is a result of a nap test that we used to to diagnose narcolepsy. We ask the patient to take these short naps and we see how fast they fall asleep. As soon as we left the room, she falls asleep extremely quickly, which is unusual. It indicates that she has daytime sleepiness. And the second thing you see is she went straight into dreaming sleep, REM sleep. And in fact, it explains a lot of the symptoms of narcolepsy. Such as dreaming while still being awake. You went straight into REM sleep. Did you dream? I think I think so. Okay. Yeah. You remember In Dr. That? Mignot's hunt for the cause of this unusual sleep disorder, yeah, man's best friend played a pivotal role. Meet Bear, a narcoleptic dog. Hello, Bear. Treats make him happy. Oh. And when he's excited or happy, he has momentary paralysis, which also occurs in people with narcolepsy. We found the cause of narcolepsy by studying the genetic form of narcolepsy in dog and by searching the gene for narcolepsy. 
when we discovered it in dog, it was a mutation in the receptor for this chemical called hypocretins. And when we discovered that, we immediately looked in humans if hypocretin was abnormal. It was. But they found that while the result was the same, the cause was not. In human narcolepsy, the culprit is the body's own immune system. During childhood or adolescence, in fighting off an infection, the immune system makes a mistake. It begins attacking the brain cells that make hypocretin. And when they are destroyed, then you get narcolepsy and you can't stay awake for a long period of time. Though narcolepsy afflicts fewer than 1% of people, understanding its cause may offer a tantalizing clue to helping many more get a better night's sleep. Hypocretin is a new neurotransmitter that was completely unknown before the discovery of its association with narcolepsy. Then now we know that hypocretin is a very important chemical in the brain to regulate your sleep and your dreaming, even normal sleep. In the past, People would say, sleep is not so important. But now, people are realizing that if you start to study any other behavior, eating, locomotion, learning, you can't ignore sleep. OK, thanks very much, folks. Sleep well. Good night. And now that we're able to journey deep into sleep, we can better decode its riddles and follow its clues in our dreams and in our genes. <laughs>